We are continuing our studies in Psalm 23. Remember, Psalm 23 is a positive confession of what belongs to the believer. It's a positive confession from beginning to end. Now, Jesus said we can have what we confess, what we say, in Mark 11:23. Whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed and cast in the sea, and not doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he saith, shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he says. So you can have what you say. David confessed, The Lord is my shepherd. Now, a shepherd provides for his sheep, and that's why David could then say, I shall not lack. Not, I shall not want. He said, I shall not lack. The believer shall lack no good thing. 1 Corinthians 3, Matthew 6.33, Philippians 4.19, as we showed you last time, that God has provided everything for the believer in Christ Jesus. It only awaits our asking, our confessing that these things belong to us. Now, in verse 2, David confessed, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Green pastures. Now that's a picture of prosperity and abundance if I ever saw it. The sheep can eat the dry grass, but they prefer the green. Why? Because they know the difference. And there are a lot of denominational sheep still living on the stale crusts of man's religion because they've never tasted the true bread. They've never been fed a real meal in their spiritual lives. But if they've ever tasted the real thing, then they'll never be satisfied again with man's box mix substitutes that he's providing them. Much of our mail that we receive from our tapes and our books that we send out by the thousands are praising God for this literature, for these messages on tape, and many say it's about their only source of real spiritual food in these end times. Even charismatics often, they tell us, are not saying anything. If you've heard them once, you've heard them. They're just repeating themselves. They say we're starving for the deeper word, and the faith message has actually spoiled us from listening to that which is not faith. But for those who will believe it, the shepherd will lead them into green pastures. Now that speaks of spiritual and material prosperity. That speaks of rest. That speaks of all of your needs being supplied. Philippians 4.19, For my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Now no shepherd ever led the sheep into a barren desert or into dry places to feed them, but into green pastures. And why Christians think Jesus does this to his sheep is beyond my comprehension. Oh, yes, they say a mark of spirituality is if you're sick all the time and poverty-stricken. You know, the measure of your spirituality is the measure of your need. And the same people who say that are spending 95% of their time doing all they can to avoid just such poverty. Most who tell you Jesus said forsake all and take up the cross and follow him haven't forsaken anything except the word of God which doesn't teach their conception of what spirituality is. As we said in the last message, Mark 10 will clearly show you you are to forsake all, but Jesus says if you do, he will give it back to you in this world as well as life eternal in the world to come. Give up your affections for these things and God will bless you and prosper you. Matthew 6.33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he said, You will not have to take thought for your material needs because God will supply them. In Philippians 4.19, we're told he'll supply them abundantly. In Third John 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health as well as your soul prospers. Psalm 37 Mark 10, many passages in the Word of God teach contrary to what some people are teaching from the pulpits. People who know the Word of God, who have faith, don't make such unscriptural statements as you hear from some people today. The Lord is not displeased if we are filled, our stomachs are filled. He's not displeased if we're not sick. He's pleased when his children are prospering and when they're healthy, when they're true examples of what a child of God ought to be. Give up your affection for these things and God will give them back to you so that you can use them for his glory. 
No, if you would spend half the time that most people are spending hunting bargains to try to save a penny, spend just half that time in the Word of God believing and claiming the promises, you'd find you wouldn't have to shop around for bargains all the time. People who are shopping for bargains don't have much faith anyway. Now in verse 2, he says, He leadeth me beside the still waters. He leadeth me. You see, in the east, the shepherds never drive their sheep. You don't drive sheep like you do horses or cattle, but they go before them and lead them. And that means he's preparing the way for them. He's giving them direction. He's going to overcome any pitfalls or obstacles or the enemy that may interfere. In John chapter 10, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd, and he says he puts forth his sheep, and then he leads them out, and when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him. Now, in our ministry of faith, we're not sending you out on some uncharted sea, some unmarked path, but we have gone before you. Everything we tell you is not only from the Word of God, but based upon experience. We know the way. We've walked these paths before you. In these faith messages, we're telling you what we've experienced. We know the Word of God, the promises of God, work for today. We know His Word is the same today as it was yesterday and will be tomorrow because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We know God will supply our needs and deliver us and protect us because we've experienced all of these things. We're not like a camel driver or a slave driver. We're like a shepherd leading the people to follow the great shepherd Jesus. We're leading them into the word of God to believe the promises. And we're not telling you to go out where we haven't been. We know God's promise of healing, for example, is valid today because we've been healed many times. We know he provides all of our needs because he's been providing our needs for over two decades. We know he delivers because we've been delivered from accident and from death. We know he leads us beside the still waters because we've come to know his perfect peace, Isaiah 26, 3. Still waters. He leads us beside still waters. Literally, the Hebrew is waters of quietness. The Lord does not lead his sheep by raging waterfalls, but by a quiet pool. He doesn't lead us by a raging Niagara. And the lives of many Christians are like a raging torrent. But the Lord has not led them there. They've ended up there because they've not believed the word of God. Because they've not followed the shepherd. Because they've tried to chart their own course and make their own paths and go their own way. That's why they're frustrated and anxious and worried. Are you aware that 50% of the beds in the hospitals are filled with people who are there, who are sick because of emotional stress, worry, and anxiety? The churches are filled with people who need deliverance from spirits of worry and fear and anxiety because they've not been taught to trust in the shepherd and to follow him. He will lead you beside the still waters if you'll let him. But the churches are overflowing with people who have never learned that salvation is a rest. They're worried, they're afraid, they're sick because they've never learned it doesn't matter how much money you have, how much food you can buy, how many cars you own, how many bedrooms there are in your home. You can only eat one meal at a time. You can only sleep in one bed at a time. You can only spend so much money at a time. You can only drive one car at a time. In other words, you can only live one day at a time. And that's exactly what Jesus says in Matthew 6 and verse 34. He says, take no thought for tomorrow. Just take thought for today. Exercise total faith in God today. Now, there's one thing that I have learned, and that is faith is a rest. I refuse to worry. I refuse to take a problem to bed with me. I practice 1 Peter 5, which tells us to cast all of our cares on Jesus because he cares for us. And I do this. I found it really works, that Jesus will bear every burden and every care and take away every problem. You can't solve your problems anyway. Why don't you take him at his word and turn them over to him? Faith is a rest. He'll lead you beside the still waters if you'll let him, the waters of quietness if you'll trust him and trust his word.
If you'll take God's word for what I'm telling you and my word for it because I've experienced these things, then you can save yourself months and years of worry and struggle and frustration. So many Christians wait until the roof caves in around their head before they learn they can't solve their problems by themselves. They can't straighten out their messed up lives. They can't, by their own wisdom and effort, straighten out their lives and solve their problems. So many people I counsel with are so mixed up why you wouldn't know where to begin to help them. And they'll say, what am I going to do? I'm so mixed up. What can I do? I say nothing, absolutely nothing. And then I say, good, that's the best position you can get in Now, since you can't do a thing, you can turn it over to God and trust Him, and He will work it out. Yes, He will. He will lead you beside the quiet waters. Psalm 23 is using the language of imagery. Isaiah 26.3 explains this verse when God says, I will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon me. And yet there's some Christians who confess, I just can't do that when I try to get my mind stayed on Jesus and get myself settled down and quiet before the Lord. Then the devil assaults my mind, distracts me, all sorts of negative thoughts break in. Well, why don't you read 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5, and you will find that God says you can bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ. Yes, you can. Start confessing you can. Remember, you're going to have what you confess. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. And so start thinking God's thoughts after him. Start thinking about yourself what he says in his word. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. You start saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me, and therefore you'll find you can. Now, God's word teaches the principle of cause and effect. What a man sows, he'll reap. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so when you're willing to accept and act on this principle, you can change the effect by changing your confession. The effect of wrong thinking and wrong confession is sickness and disease and fear, failure, adversity, and death. When you allow thoughts of hate and envy, resentment, defeat, inability, criticism, and so forth, saturate your mind, then you will confess to these things. You will testify to them. Your conversation will be filled with the negative. God made us in such a way that what we think and what we say has an effect upon our health, upon our circumstances, upon our lives. The principle of cause and effect of sowing and reaping is set forth throughout the Word of God. You can read it over and over. You're going to get what you say. So start believing the Word of God and confessing the Word of God. God's Word is positive. You'll find that God doesn't talk the negative. And when you speak the negative, when you speak doubt and fear, then you're confessing contrary to God and His Word. Confess what God says and you shall possess what He promises.